Yeah, right. <laughs> Didn't hear anything. Um, and now, so. I believe I don't tweet on anyone's toes here in this room when I say everyone has more or less the same conceptual model about web application development in his head. Um, you develop some server code, you develop some client code to be run in the browser, um, you design some nice HTML pages, and then you deploy all on this on a server that's more or less under your control, to a certain degree at least. And people using your shiny new application fetch it from that server together with all the, all the user-generated data, which is profile information, metadata, uh, uploaded images, uploaded documents, all that stuff. This, state, this data is stored on your server too. The majority of today's web applications is driven by such user-generated content like Facebook and Dropbox and all that stuff, and GitHub. Um, and one consequence of that deployment model uh, I just outlined is that the creation of the content itself is decentralized because every user um, creates some parts of the content and the storage and the profit from the data uh, is centralized on a single server or uh, by a single vendor. Um, do you, have to something, do you have to say something that more people, like more people in this room, um, are out to hear? And do you want to share a piece of information with other people over the internet? What are your choices then? I outlined two options that you have. The first one is you do it all yourself. You get a web server. You get a software to run on, like a blogging platform software, a DNS name, which is kind of important, and I'm going to detail on that later on, and a constant internet connectivity. Now, this is sometimes hard to imagine for web developers like us who do this all the time, but doing this, taking option one, requires a huge amount of knowledge. Like my mother and my grandma, they can't rent a server and deploy some blogging software on that server to, to have access to the content. Um, so they probably tend to using option two. Let someone else do it. Like in a drive through you take advantage of a one-stop third-party um, solution for getting your content published on the internet. Um, we have a wide range of services to choose from, which is uh, Dropbox, Facebook, GitHub, Flickr, just to name the most obvious ones, and the biggest ones. But by doing this, you lock yourself into a platform that you have no control whatsoever about. You don't even have ownership of the namespace you used to reach your content, right? This is the URL. The namespace like facebook.com slash, I don't know, your profile, is owned by Facebook. And if you want to migrate your data from Facebook to another platform, um, you can't make your profile accessible via facebook.com slash your profile name anymore because Facebook owns that namespace. Now how about we take back control over the content that we create? How about we leverage the decentralized structure of the internet and the web, like it was ever, and create a user-controlled infrastructure for content creation, publishing, addressing, and sharing. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. Over the last two and a half years, um, my colleague and I at the university, we developed a user-centric architecture for decentralizing content creation, content storage, addressing, and distribution all inside your browser. And the main building block for this decentralized platform is WebRTC. Um, you know, the Internet Explorer and the Safari logos are a bit ahead because they um, don't implement WebRTC right now, um, but they will, sooner or later. Um, I'm going to talk about this later. 
WebRTC is like the new buzzword on the web, and it's it's kind of uh, hard to to get a hand on what WebRTC actually is. So I went to the internet. Um, what do you usually do and try to find a resolu resolution is really bad, but right. I hope you can read all the stuff here. Yeah. Um, I went to the internet and um, yeah, fetched some definitions of what WebRTC actually is. The first one is uh, from the webrtc.org website, which is hosted by Google. And it says, WebRTC is a free open project that provides browsers and mobile applications with real-time communications capabilities via simple APIs. The second one is from Wikipedia, and it says WebRTC is an API definition drafted by the World Web Consortium that supports browser-to-browser -browser applications for voice calling, video chat, and file sharing without the need of either internal or external plugins. And the third definition here is uh, from TalkBox. Um, very big user of WebRTC. Um, they deployed WebRTC applications on the internet already, and they are profiting from it. And they say WebRTC is a communication standard developed by the W3C in close cooperation with the RTC Web Standard developed by the ITF. RTC Web functions at a lower protocol layer. WebRTC enables the embedding of this function in applications and websites. The protocol is commonly used to spot voice over chat between peers. So we have three different definitions that, that relate to the same thing, which is WebRTC, but they, they focus on different, on, on, on different targets, you know? And, and this is like the problem, because WebRTC is a really huge thing, and it's not easy to get a handle on it. So it's, an, it's, a, it's a project, um, it's an API, it's a communication standard, and that's the thing which, is, which, I, think, uh, which I think is, is most clearly um, WebRTC is a communication standard. Um, it consists of APIs and protocols and all that stuff. But to make things simple, um, I drew up a graphic, like I always do when I, when I want to grab things and, and I want to understand things. And this is how web applications right now uh, function. Uh, there's no WebRTC involved. Like, this is WebRTC. This comes later, right? Um, so you have, a, you have um, a browser here, you have a browser here, you have JavaScript, HTML DOM stuff, and they communicate um, to the server and yeah, uh, send data to the server that is uh, relayed to the other browser and all that stuff. So you have chat application, for example, and um, when you send a message to the other user, it gets sent to the server and the server sends it back to the other user. Now here comes WebRTC. It bridges the gap that we, that we have here when two users want to communicate with each other, right? We have a channel, a communications channel for audio video, uh, for audio and video, and for file sharing and generic data stuff um, directly between the two browsers. This is all um, that WebRTC brings us. And I've conducted this, this table, um, which I think sums this up quite, quite good. So actually right now, before WebRTC, um, we have or we had actually three communications APIs in the browser. The first one is HTTP, which everyone of you knows. Um, it's, it's asynchronous, uh, it's not asynchronous, but if you use Ajax, it's asynchronous, all right. Um, it's a client server architecture because you have a browser, sends a GET request or POST request or another HTTP request um, to the server and the server answers this, this request. So it's unidirectional. The server can't send an HTTP request to your browser. The second thing is server send events, which I don't know, who of you knows server sends events? Uh, server send events, right. <laughs> who of you uses server send events? Two of you, right. <laughs> Um, I really, I really like server send events um, because um, it's it's actually a push channel from the server to the client and nothing more. It's it's that simple. Um, uh, it's better for WebSocket if you just want to have push to your client um, because it it doesn't come with that overhead of WebSockets. Um, but also it's client server only. 
you can open a server send events connection to your server and uh, it then can send unidirectionally events to your client. Um, the third one is WebSockets. I think most of you knows, know uh, WebSockets. Um, it's a bidirectional channel between a client and a, uh, a, a client and a server, so browser and a web server. Um, but it's the client server, right? So here comes WebRTC. Uh, it has all the same capabilities when it comes to asynchronicity and bidirectional communication. But the important thing is this: it's peer-to-peer, -peer. like I had it on the on the slide here, right? You have a direct channel between two browsers, and all the data that you send through this channel is never seen by the server. And that's important for, for, the, for the framework I'm going to describe later. So to sum this up, WebRTC is this. It enables direct communication between two browsers, um, and it comes with a lot of technical stuff underneath. First thing is you have not traversal which is so important if you want to have peer-to-peer -peer communication. Because without net traversal, uh, you probably won't reach like 90% of internet users today, I don't know, um, but it's a huge, huge percentage of users that are behind some uh, not gateway, like network address translation, right? Um, and WebRTC handles all of this for you. And this is really hard, as I've seen over the last three years, um, when the ITF standardized um, the natural traversal stuff of WebRTC. It's really hard to do. And still, you have um, WebRTC clients which can't be reached using, using uh, WebRTC because the nuts are, um, they call full cone nuts, and, and they actually, they can't be reached from the outside. They can't open a port uh, and say, okay, um, uh, talk to me via this port. This just doesn't work and it, will, it never will, right? Um, but all the other nuts are traversable uh, using WebRTC. So you have no intermediary server for the communication. For the connection setup, you will need a server. I'll talk about this. Um, but if you, once you have the channel, you won't need a server anymore. You can disconnect from the server completely. Very important thing. You have secure transfer protocol for audio and video data. All the WebRTC uh, all, the, all the data that is sent through a WebRTC channel is encrypted by default and you will not be able to not send encrypted data, right? This is very important because the, the ITF working group um, uh, had hard discussions about this. Um, how they are gonna uh, encrypt the channel, how, how they are gonna um, exchange the keys for the encryption. Um, I was at the ITF meeting in Berlin, I think in 2013, and um, it was uh, even an emotional discussion what uh, key exchange mechanism they are going to use. And they chose the mechanism that is actually the most secure, which is um, SCTP DTLS. It, never mind about the, the, the terminology, it's, it's the mechanism where um, it, it uses Diffie-Hellman key exchange so the server won't be able to, um, to, to get the keys used for the encryption. And there was another, um, uh, there was another standard um, proposed to exchange the keys, which is called uh, SDES, and this, and this and exchanges the keys um, via the server. Um, this is known from SIP. I don't know who, who, who's from the VoIP world. Um, they probably know uh, SDES. So uh, uh, SCTP DTLS is used and it makes the channel most secure. Um, yeah, as I've said, um, if you come from the VoIP world, you will probably know what uh, SCP and offer answer is. Um, I will explain this later. Um, yeah, and you have optional source authentication. This is a thing that is standardized but not implemented right now. Um, and it's optional for your application to use. Um, but yeah, let's just say it is there. And to enable all this stuff, they included in the browsers this huge pile of technology, right? When Firefox, um, uh, I developed some, some WebRTC code in Firefox and um, when they started including WebRTC in, their, in the browser, it was like 
10,000 lines of code, right? They, they included a complete SIP stack. Um, SIP is the session initiation protocol used for, for uh, VoIP calling, voice over IP. And um, yeah, they included this whole library um, uh, to work on that because it's very similar to how WebRTC works. We have uh, communication completely over UDP, which is different from all the other communication we have uh, right now in the browsers, or we had before WebRTC. Um, and UDP is used because we, we, we want to have real-time capabilities. We want to have real-time audio and video chat. And UDP is the way to go when you want to have that. Right? Um, we have eyes. Um, it's, it's actually it's, it's on top here. Um, I don't know if that's really correct. There are very different um, schemas of, the, of this stack. Sometimes ICE is just uh, besides here because it only helps you initiate a connection. But actually, um, programmatically, ICE is a layer, right? They, they, they say, OK, give me a connection, and ICE returns the connection, the ICE library. Um, you have DTLS on top, which is, which is um, very similar to TLS. So, pardon? Uh, I, oh, ICE is the interactivity, interactive uh, com communication exchange. Is that right? All right, so, um, yeah, let's, let's hold this up. Um, it actually makes all the nut traversal stuff, right? Uh, it encapsulates stun and encapsulates turn. Um, uh, I think it's a bunch of three, four, five RFCs. You can read that if you like. It's, it's not very handy. and it, doesn't make very much fun to read that. Um, and it encapsulates all the strategies you have for um, traversing a nut using stun or a turn to. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when, when you say eyes, um, like connect me somewhere, it actually returns uh, a list of IP addresses. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, and we have RTP on top, which is also known from VoIP. It's the real-time transfer protocol. Uh, we have the secure version of RTP here, and only the secure version. Um, and we have the media stream API on top, which is actually the API, uh, the API that you are going to use when you want to initiate uh, audio or video chat, audio video connection. Uh, Partly, yes, uh, because everything f uh, for itself is already there, right? But um, taking this all together and making it work um, with each other um, is, is not re very easy, and they developed new RFCs for that. Um, yeah, and we have uh, a data channel API, which is the API used uh, for generic data transfer, like which is not audio and not video. Uh, so you can send strings and blobs and all that stuff. Um, JavaScript blobs. Um, and SCTP, SCTP is the transfer protocol used for exchanging that data. And on top of SCTP, you have the data channel API that you are going to use in the browser, in your JavaScript application. So actually, um, uh, for example, here we have um, for the uh, communication between SCTP and DTLS and UDP, there are standards that are called like uh, SCTP over DTLS because normally you would run DTLS over SCTP um, to, to, to gain the um, capabilities of SCTP, which is multi-homing and all that stuff. Um, but they said, okay, we don't need that. We, we just put SCTP on top of DTLS. Um, and they developed a new RFC for that, a new standard. Does everyone know what an RFC is? Uh, right. An RFC is a request for comments. Um, it's, it's actually not a standard. Uh, they, they don't, the ITF develops these standards, the Internet Engineering Task Force, and they don't want it to be called standard, but I, I'm just going to stick to standard and because, because everyone sees the RFCs as standard. Um, and they develop protocols for the Internet yeah, and mechanisms and all that stuff. So what's the, um, basically what you need uh, to know is the media stream API and the data channel API. 
And let's take a look at how these work. Uh, WebRTC um, gets you an RTCP connection object that you can instantiate. Um, in older browsers, it's called uh, Mods RTC Peer Connection or WebKit RTC Peer Connection. Um, I think most um, current versions, or at least the most current versions, um, have removed the, the prefix, so you can just instantiate an RTC Peer Connection. Um, and then you do some magic on it. Um, first thing is, the channel uh, is something uh, we, j we just uh, say we have. It can be a WebSocket channel, it can be, I don't know, an XMPP channel or uh, an email channel, if you like. Um, the important thing is you instantiate PC, like RTCP connection, and you create an offer. I said um, to the signaling to connect two browsers uh, is, uh, is called uh, offer answer. Uh, so you create an offer, and then the ICE stuff um, uh, starts working and collects all the IP addresses you are reachable at. Can be local IP addresses or remote, uh, like like internet uh, reachable IP addresses, uh, whatever is appropriate for your web web browser for your host. Um, and you just call create offer, and a huge bunch of uh, technology starts working for you, which is like the stack. Um, and you provide and create offer call, which is just a JavaScript function. Um, say, uh, say you set local description, um, which says, okay, this is uh, the peer connection uh, with, with this offer. Um, and you send this offer to, to Bob at, in, in this case. And Bob receives this on a channel, which is an arbitrary channel, um, and says set remote description using your offer, right? Um, and so it sees, okay, there is someone who wants to connect to me, and his offer looks like this. And then you say, okay, I want to connect. You can have logic here, but let's just say you want to connect to everyone wanting to connect to you. You create an answer and provide this function, uh, the create answer callback. Um, you create an answer and send this answer right back on the channel you have. Let's say it's a WebSocket. So we have Client Alice sending the offer to the um, to Bob. Bob accepts this offer, sends the answer back, and then we have an RTCP connection. Actually, we have an, a Web RTC connection, right? Yes. It depends. Um, I'm not actually talking about audio video calling here because I want to talk about like decentralizing the web without audio video calls. Um, when you want to um, get access from your application to the user's microphone, to the user's um, uh, speakers, um, you say um, uh, get, get, get media stream, I think, and um, then a, like a door hanger or pop-up appears in the browser and it says, okay, this application wants to access your microphone, wants to access your speakers, right? And then you have to acknowledge that and then it can actually create the offer or the answer. So there's user interaction involved when you, when you are using audio video calling. But we wanna focus on data channels and there's no user interaction involved. Um, let's not talk about privacy and security here uh, right now. Let's just accept that. Um, we can talk about this and discuss about this later on. Um, I say I have a peer connection here. I've created the peer connection using new window RTC peer connection, um, and I want to create a data channel on that peer connection. You have no address, right? Ah, oh, right. Yeah. The thing is, um, the signaling, like the saying. Um, how do I know which user I have to send um, my offer to? It's not part of the standard. It's completely out of scope from the standard, right? They, and they explicitly wanted to do this because they wanted to say um, every application can uh, address, can identify its users uh, like 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 it like it uh, wants to address them, and. Um, Uh, 
Um, yeah, actually, it's a JavaScript application. So you got to fetch that, fetch it from somewhere, right? Um, I'm going to show you how uh, how this is done later. Um, um, it's a simple web application uh, using JavaScript APIs, just like any other web application right now. Um, and you can implement the signaling as you wish. And you can say, okay, I want to I want to have a, like I said, that channel doesn't have to be a WebSocket channel. It can be um, an email channel, for example. And you, you can send an offer via email, accept the offer, like somehow cut and paste and all that stuff. We did that um, while debugging. And um, yeah, it's completely out of scope of the standard. So addressing the user is not part of WebRTC. It just says, OK, I have this IP address and, and, and this port that I can be reached on, and I want to have this SCTP port opened and that SRTP port opened, and then, <clears throat> and then I can um, initiate the connection. Um, all right. Um, yeah, and then I have this WebRTC connection. I want to create a data channel. I want to send data to the other user, like a string like hi Bob, and I just say create data channel, and when the data channel is opened, uh, my open callback uh, function is called, and I can send data on the channel. On the other side, uh, Bob says, okay, when someone wants to initiate, or when, when Alice on this peer connection wants to initiate data channel connection, I say, okay, um, I accept that, and the data channel is part of the event, it's the target of the event, um, and when a message comes in, I alert the user with the message. It's that simple. It's a huge technology stack just to having like two or three JavaScript calls, right? This one? Uh, this, you have a peer connection already to Alice. Like you have a WebRTC channel. And Alice says, okay, I want to have a data channel. And then uh, Bob's browser uh, fires this event, this data channel event. And then you can say, okay, um, I'll accept the data channel or not, right? Okay, don't be scared by this. If you have never seen this, it's not that important, but um, yeah, for, uh, for completeness, I want to show it. This is an offer sent by one browser to another browser. So when I say um, create offer, like I said here, uh, cre uh, create offer. This is created. It's just a string. It's um, SDP, session description protocol. Um, and it contains all the stuff needed for, um, for opening a, a WebRTC uh, data channel in this case. So as you can see here, there are candidates for IP addresses. We have the local IP address here. And we have a remote. Uh, um, it's a server reflexive address, so it's an address uh, which f from for which you can be reached from the outside, um, and all this stuff is sent over to to Bob, and then he knows uh, how to connect to you. Um, yeah, so this is very much into detail now, but most of the uh, of the cases when you are developing WebRTC applications, you don't have to mangle with these. And uh, in, the, in the in the past. Um, Browsers were not very compatible with each other, with with each other. So um, users and uh, programmers had to to uh, tweak a little bit on the SDP generated and stuff, and do some magic with it, um, so that, for example, um, uh, Chrome understands the offer that Firefox generates and stuff. And you can see the uh, the second line contains Mozilla SIP UA, uh, and you see it's it's just a SIP stack. Um, I don't know if, if it's um, if they exchanged it uh, in the past, but uh, when when I created this offer, it still had the user agent Mozilla SIP UA. So let's take a breath and um, yeah, think about how how can we, can we actually use this to take our control back over our data? And this is where the thing that I created over the last two and a half years comes into play. And it's called Bublish. Um, it's short for browser-based open publishing. We didn't come up with a better name, so uh, we just stick with it. And it actually does this. It creates a peer-to-peer -peer network between browsers. Um, and not 
all of these browsers has a server connection. Just the one there has a WebSocket connection to the signaling server. All the other, other browsers don't have a connection to the server um, that they fetch the applications from. So you connect once, once to the server, fetch all the HTML, JavaScript, CSS stuff, and then you can close the connection uh, and be part of the peer-to-peer -peer network. And no data exchanged in this peer-to-peer -peer network is sent to the server, right? That's, uh, that is, uh, was the, the first prototype we, we developed, and it's a full mesh, yeah, right. Um, <laughs> not at all. So what we did was um, we implemented, we, we exchanged that full mesh uh, with the DHT, with the cord DHT. But I'm going to talk about this. So what do we need to actually have a peer-to-peer -peer network that lets us, that, that let's take us the control over our data back. So we thought about it and, and came up with the, these three main requirements. The first one is you need a routing layer for routing the data. You need content names. Like I said, dropbox.com is owned by Dropbox and you can migrate your content to somewhere else and stick with the name. So you need a, a, like, a like a proprietary name uh, which is bound to your name, to your uh, ownership and a name resolution mechanism to have mobility and all that stuff. And you need a simple API. I really like the WebRTC API because it's, it's, it's that simple to use, like I, sh like I showed. So we want to come up with a simple API. At the what? Uh, yeah, um, we didn't take specifically a look at Freifunk, um, but we took a look at, at how uh, um, yeah, like a performant routing uh, network peer-to-peer -peer can be implemented like uh, Batman or... Um, they're using Batman still? All right. Um, we came up with another solution. First thing was we built a prototype um, for having a, a simple routing mechanism. So we have these three peers, they are connected, peer one is connected to peer two, and peer two is connected to peer three via a data channel, a WebRTC data channel. And now peer one, what, peer one wants to connect to peer three uh, using peer two, like using just, just the data channel it has, because it has no server connection. And so we came up with a mechanism that, that creates the offer and sends the offer via the data channel and not via an, just via, via an external signaling mechanism, like it's done with all other applications right now. They just use the server to exchange signaling. So if you lose connection to the server, um, yeah, you, you're screwed. Um, and so we said, all right, we want to have signaling inside our peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so it's that simple. You create an offer, peer one creates an offer, sends it to peer two, which is the only peer connected to peer one, and says, all right, send this offer to peer three. Somehow, I don't care how, um, part of the routing protocol. And peer two, hey, it apparently is connected to peer three, so it sends the, uh, sends the offer directly to peer three. Peer three accepts the offer, sends the answer back via peer two, and voila, you have a data channel connection. <laughs> yeah, this is something you have to implement. Pardon? Yes. Um, the thing is, identity and uh, security is completely, you are actually completely on your own. When you want to implement, implement privacy, identity, and security in a WebRTC application, that has um, advantages and it has disadvantages. Um, in the conclusion, actually, um, I'll get to that, right? Because we thought about that too. Um, Okay, routing is done, more or less. Um, actually, let's say it, it works. Yeah, you can, you can use a peer-to-peer -peer network to send offers and answers. Now we want to name the content that is inside the peer-to-peer -peer network, the, the publish network. And um, we came up with the requirements that names have to be location independent. So if I have uh, my cell phone, like where is it here? Uh, my cell phone, and um, I have some content that I published from my cell phone, 
And now I want to migrate that content to my laptop and publish the data uh, from the laptop under the same name. The, the name has to be location independent. Um, this is different from DNS because in DNS, names are location bound, right? You have an IP address, you have a DNS name, and the IP address is, is actually, it sticks to the host. There are ways to make DNS like location independent, but these are more or less hacks and they are not really re real time because DNS has a propagation delay. Um, and yeah, said that we want to have easy replication and migration. So we want to have perhaps our data um, uh, published from my cell phone and published from my laptop at once, right? So we said, okay, we want to use URIs because users know what URIs are, like more or less they know how they look like and they say, oh, that's a URL. Okay, it's a URI, but all right. Um, let's not be picky. Um, so we created a, a scheme for names um, in Boplish. Um, and it is a scheme Bob because shorter than Boplish and our professor didn't like Boplish. Okay, we said, okay, let's stick with Bob. Um, and you have username at IDP. Um, which is like proprietary to our Boplish solution, it has nothing to do with WebRTC. We just said, okay, we want to have uh, like this name so we can have um, identity, uh, some identity solution which is like encoded in the name. And we can say, okay, username at IDP. The IDP can be like, let's say, facebook.com when you want to use Facebook for identifying you. Um, and then you implement a protocol for. Um, asserting the identity. Actually, we, we uh, didn't implement that right now because we stick with the other cases. Um, but in the URI, URI it's already uh, uh, like included and we can uh, put it on top. And then you have um, column protocol, uh, which is just a string, and it's like a port in TCP. So how does the name resolution work? Um, as you said, a uh, full mesh doesn't scale. Um, yeah, doesn't. I, I don't think uh, anyone is, is um, wonders why why it doesn't scale. Um, and you can only have like uh, 64 or 100 WebRTC connections in one browser instance. And so we came up with using a DHT. Uh, DHTs are distributed hash table, and they are just a distributed key value store. Uh, you have a network of peers, um, and you say, all right, I want to store key X under the value Y in the peer-to-peer -peer network, and the peer-to-peer -peer network does all the stuff for you, the DHT. Um, here's a, sh a very simple graphic of how a uh, CORD DHT works. CORD is a DHT implementation. Um, it's not quite new, but it works, and it's very scalable. Um, and it works like this. You have all, all these dots are nodes uh, in your peer-to-peer -peer network. So they are browsers in Boplish. And every, every node, every browser has an ID. And um, stores uh, like jump points uh, in its finger table. It's like a routing table. Um, for, like logarithmically. So we can search the peer-to-peer -peer network uh, logarithmically. Um, so you don't have, um, uh, you're not as performant like a full mesh when it comes to lookup because it has a complexity of a one. But you have a complexity, uh, a logarithmic complexity here, looking up keys and looking up hosts for keys. And so every host is uh, responsible for a specific key space. This uh, node 83, uh, 38 is responsible for the key space here. Uh, and every key has an ID, which is, which is um, uh, part of the, of the circle, like from 0 to, I don't know, 64. <coughs> and uh, 38 is responsible for storing the keys for 38 or from 31 to, uh, 33 to 38, right? So if, you, if you're storing something under key 37, it's stored on this node the value, right? So this is a, a simple peer-to-peer -peer network using CORD. Uh, the thing we liked about CORD and DHTs uh, as such are that the IPR is very simple too. And we like simple API. Um, you just call put on your distribute hash table implementation uh, with the key and the value. 
you can call remove to remove the key. Um, you can get the key and uh, uh, the values some, somehow is returned. Uh, we don't care how, it's implementation specific. And so uh, we stick with that. And the IPI that, that, um, yeah, that, that concludes all this uh, is that. This is a simple Boblish client in, in the peer-to-peer -peer network. You fetch uh, JavaScript as a user, you fetch the JavaScript which contains this code, and you instantiate as a developer a Boblish client saying, okay, what is the signaling server? This is a WebSocket signaling server. Um, and when you're connected to the peer-to-peer -peer network, um, uh, which, which, which uh, includes you have an ID, you have uh, gotten an ID, and you are part of the court ring and all that stuff, then the onConnect method is called and you can do whatever you like when you are connected to a peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, and what you can do then is, I said, uh, we have this protocol here, so uh, every client can run different protocols in inside a Boblish network. Uh, and you can say, all right, register this protocol, which is group chat here. So you have a group chat application, and you want to say, okay, um, I want to be reachable at the protocol group chat. So the URI would be bob uh, colon user at example.com uh, slash uh, group chat, uh, colon group chat. Uh, and then you can receive messages on this protocol, right? So every client does this um, and can also call, oh, I didn't include that. Okay. Every client can also um, send data on this protocol. And now don't be scared. This is how Publish looks like when it's done and implemented and running. Uh, we have three nodes here. Alice at example.org, Bob at example.com and Carol at example.com. All are part, uh, all have a name, an ID, um, and all are part of the DHT, of the court wing, right? So they have this connection here. Um, Alice is uh, key three, Bob is key nine, and Carol is key one. Um, and now Alice has, has this name, Alice at example.org, and hosts different applications and different data on the client. For example, a chat room, chat room one, have, uh, we have here uh, under the protocol chat. Uh, we have a protocol document running on this host, uh, serving the file picar.png, uh, and we have a search protocol implemented here, uh, and you can host, for example, a search slash uh, asterisk tng asterisk, so people can search for stuff on your host. Um, and the name resolution now is part of the DHT. So we, we don't store the content in the DHT, but we store only um, key and value pairs which, uh, which say, okay, Alice has this ID. And then we can say, okay, connect me to ID three, right? So we have mobility here because uh, when, when Alice moves somewhere else or, or Alice wants to host uh, her content from another host, it just joins the DHT and sets a new value there in the finger table of all the hosts and says, okay, Alice at example.org is now reachable at key five, right? Hosted? The DHT, the DHT is, is, is like formed. Ah, right. Um, so the question was, uh, where's the DHT hosted? The DHT is hosted nowhere, right? The DHT is made up of all the peers. It's, it's like a, a, a virtual model, right? You have, you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. I don't want to go too far, right? You have a peer-to-peer -peer network, and they form a DHT, right? Using this API. Yes. Everyone hosts a little, a little part of the DHT. Every host has some key and value uh, pairs, and so they form up the DHT. And um, Cord has a routing layer too for you, so it's, so um, there's a very easy to read paper on the internet um, which explains Cord. It's actually the, the first paper on Cord, the inventors of Cord wrote it, and it's very easy to read, and very easy to implement too, that's, and that's because we, we used Cord. There are better ones, 
like uh, Camellia, uh, for example. Um, but code is uh, yeah, like easy to implement, and our architecture of Publish um, is structured so that we can exchange code with Camellia, for example, very easily. Yes. Yes. Um, the thing is, you are right. That's like part of a P2P network. <laughs> I always forget that. Um, the question was, when one ho host gets down, a, par a part of the key space gets lost, right? And you have to rearrange the key space. There are very many papers on having replication inside a uh, DHT, not only code, but other DHTs. So um, we can say, all right, uh, Alice hosts some keys um, and, and replicates the data across the wing so that the, um, so that the probability that all the data gets lost when, when a host gets down uh, near, is nearly zero. I mean, when every but one host loses connection to the network, you're kind of screwed, right? Um, but um, in, a, in a big peer-to-peer -peer network, this is actually uh, not going to happen. Just let's, let's say this. Um, oh, wait. Um, OK, this is very technically, and I think um, uh, we won't go deeper on that. Um, it's just a sketch, and if you if you want to know more about how we implemented that, we can you can ask the questions later. I'm just going to show you what what the use cases are for Boblish. Part of that I, I already said. They are document sharing, content search, real time chat. These are three use cases we implemented. Document sharing is is, is very nice because. Um, because of the quote. Every time you email a file to yourself so we can pull it on your friend's laptop, Tim Berners-Lee sheds a single tear, right? File sharing is so stupidly difficult um, still. And we said, okay, we want to make it easy. We want to we wanna have a, a, a host um, which is part of publish and just says, okay, I want to publish this file, get a URL and done, right? Um, and this is how it works. Um, the host is max at example.org. Um, I forgot the protocol. This is here, uh, you put your uh, colon document just mentally. Um, and you have a URI. So, the, so you upload uh, a file, like to your application. You have to implement that, like uploading file, reading the file from the local file system and stuff, generating the URI. Um, but then you have a URI for sharing that document. And you share that URI, like via Jabber or email. Uh, the other user you want to you wanna send the file to um, uh, boots up its, uh, his uh, publish application, um, types in this, this URI, and the uh, file is fetched uh, using publish, right? You can even implement uh, parameters and you can say, okay, the checksum of the file must be so and so, so you can have checksums and all that stuff. Um, content search is another use case we came up with. Um, all right, I forgot the protocols in every use case. Um, you can search for files, you can implement file searching applications and say, okay, I don't know the URI, I want to search on the, on the hosts, on the, on the host um, shared files. Um, you can implement a real-time chat and say, okay, I'm Alice, I want to host a chat group. Um, the room is called room one. The URI is generated for me. You can uh, probably read it. It's, it's um, printed out here. Uh, it's called Star Trek chat in this uh, example. And then Alice sends this URI to another user, boots up his publish application, and joins the chat room, All right? So where can you see this thing at work? This like <laughs> kind of complex thing. Um, we, po we, we published all that stuff on GitHub. Um, we have an organization called Publish on GitHub, uh, which hosts core and demos and uh, some, other, uh, some other stuff. Um, also an emulation component uh, where you can emulate a Publish network uh, using Node.js. Uh, we use that for uh, using uh, for for doing some evaluation on performance and stuff, and um, 
I can't ascertain that this works right now because one problem is that um, WebRTC is a standard um, like work in progress, very much in progress, right? And the, the API like changes with, with every major browser version. Um, so I can't make sure that the core library works, right? So if you if you have a prob problem with that, just just um, issue a pull request at best, or just open an issue, and we'll get to that. And yeah. So uh, forty five minutes are over, or a bit more. Um, and I want to take some questions if you like. Short a uh, recap. <laughs> Short recap. Um, we have created Boblish, which provides a framework for distributed content communities. That's what we're calling it. Um, and it's as simple as using boblish.js uh, in your application, calling the Boblish client API, uh, and you're part of a DHT, right? Uh, of, a, of a P2P network, right? Um, the thing is, our experience from the last three years is that WebRTC is cumbersome at times. Um, I hope that this will get better. I don't know. Um, because browser vendors are like a bit picky about what they want to implement and what they don't want to implement, how they want to implement ICE and STUN and all that stuff. Um, so like I said, sometimes the library works, sometimes the library doesn't work, and you have to adapt it to make it work. And in the early days, Firefox couldn't connect to Chrome because the SDP uh, uh, parsing was, was different. And yeah, all that stuff. If you are interested in the WebRTC progress, um, you should join the ITF RTC web mailing list. It's called RC RTC web um, because they don't want to rename it to WebRTC. <laughs> and it's a very early, early historic name. Um, I really encourage you to join the mailing list because it's very interesting what, what they are discussing there. We have quite a bit of to-dos uh, for Boblish. Uh, for example, uh, mobility, like fastly switching between peers, which have the same ID. Uh, content offloading, like saying, um, I'm hosting the content on my cell phone, but I'm going to turn my cell phone into flight mode, and I want to uh, uh, offload the content to another host. Uh, yeah, peer-to-peer -peer stability is really uh, not an easy issue. It's not only like it's not only our problem; it's a problem of of peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks a, as such. Um, we can improve on that. On that, and security, which includes identity, privacy, and all that stuff. We we didn't focus on that very much, and it's a completely it's a completely different topic. Yeah, right. You can you can like publish a paper on security with publish and have, having identity and privacy and all that stuff handled with publish. It is doable, but you just have to do it. And perhaps um, we are going to do it in our research group. I don't know. Yeah, so that's actually it. Um, if you like, I'm going to take some questions if you have time. And oh, sorry. <coughs> yes. Yeah. The question was if you, as a user, have to acknowledge that a data channel is created. The answer is no. Every application you fetch from the internet can open a data channel to another peer without the user actually recognizing it. There's no acknowledgement about that. Pardon? Yeah, um, you said, he said um, there's an option to disable WebRTC in Chrome. Yeah, of course. But then you don't have WebRTC, right? Uh, so you can, <coughs> you, you have to enable it, go to the application you want to use, uh, use the application, and then disable WebRTC again. I don't think it's something that my mom would do, right? <laughs> you have a question? Yeah, of course. The, uh, yeah, uh, he said, does depend on DNS. Of course, we depend on DNS because without DNS, you won't be able to fetch um, the application. But we reduced 
the, uh, the dependence on DNS to the most viable minimum, right? So we said, as soon as you have joined the peer-to-peer -peer network, you're not dependent on DNS anymore. You can load applications from the file system. Um, we, we had some strange experience with that using WebRTC um, because they had like other permissions and stuff, but um, there are people doing this actually. There's, on, on GitHub, there's an application that, that does this, um, a file sharing application that you can load from your file system and that uses some signaling server um, and um, <coughs> uh, then joins a, uh, another peer. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, he said um, NuNet is working on uh, G G GNS. <laughs> right. GNU name system. Okay, I don't know that. I, I must admit. But yeah, it's it's like. Um, they're working on a client that's that's like a native client on platform, so right? It's not it's not on the web. Okay. Okay. Yeah, the, the things there are many applications like there are many P2P applications. There are even BitTorrent clients implemented in WebRTC. Um, I, I didn't uh, test these. I didn't, I didn't make any experiments on these. Um, but there's very much going on uh, in the in the P2P world using WebRTC because you have browsers on every device, right? On every device that is connected to the internet, there's a browser. And so this device is probably can be a part of a peer-to-peer -peer network. And this is something that we never had before, right? More questions, yeah. No, I don't. Um, the question is, um, do you have any numbers on uh, when does I succeed and when, when does I fail, like the net traversal? Um, I don't have any numbers. Google um, is doing very much experimentation on that, and they probably have current numbers. Um, my experience from just a handful of tests is that in my company it didn't work, and at the university, funnily, it sometimes didn't work. right? Um, at the university, we, we have static IP addresses. Of course, this works. Um, but um, when you're behind a nut at the at my university, uh, which is in Hamburg, uh, it it didn't work. So uh, I tested like three or five setups, and two of them didn't work, which is forty percent. Um, I don't think it's that bad. Uh, like when you when you run a test on the on the internet, but yeah, perhaps. There are numbers. I, I don't know about current numbers. Perhaps on the mailing list they are. They they have uh, discussed um, a bit about uh, a bit about delay between uh, different locations of the world. And there was part of that was not traversal, but uh, yeah, you have to search through the mailing list archive. The thing is, um, in our evaluation, I have, some, I have some stuff here. Let's look at the gas bootstrap performance. Um, <clears throat> um, I won't go into very much detail here. This is the hop count. Uh, you, have to, you have to bypass to initiate a connection. And this is the delay for the initial connection. Uh, and as you can see, uh, with yeah, zero, uh, zero, zero. And with, with uh, one hop count, you have a delay of more than one second. Um, but it, yeah, it, it, um, it's quite, it, it stays at a level when you have reached a certain hop count. Um, uh, because, yeah, with, with uh, Boblish, 
uh, you only have that much connections open. So as soon as you have five or six connections open uh, in the court, in your finger table, um, you won't need to open any more WebRTC connections. So we, we handle that. And opening a WebRTC connection can uh, last very long, seconds. Because ICE is very verbose. <laughs> Yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, the question is, can I use WebRTC or Bublish in a native application? And the answer is yes, because um, first thing is uh, WebRTC uh, Chrome has always had a, a single library, libwebrtc or libjingle uh, was called in the past. Um, which you can use in C and C++ applications. Uh, Firefox is working on tearing out all this huge stack <coughs> of WebRTC um, to publish uh, a C and C++ library. Um, and the third thing is, or the second thing is, if you want, um, that you, like I said, we have an emulation uh, uh, running in Node.js. You can use that and like build a native application using Node.js, right? And, and having published one on Node.js. Um, yeah, I'm getting signaled that we are at the end. Um, so if you want to discuss more, I'm, I'm, I'm here for some more minutes. And yeah, thank you for your attention. <laughs>